Thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for the wonderful invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I get started, I should say that this is going to be an overview talk of um, this hobby of mine and my collaborators. Um, I should mention Jonathan Funk. Uh, most of the work I'll present is joined with him, and some of my students are involved as well. Um, so this is going to be a very low-level talk. I'm going to introduce the definition of the isotropy group of Atopos, look at some examples, some basic theory, and hopefully along the way we get a chance to see how it interacts with, say, logical aspects or algebraic aspects of Atopos as, as well. So to get started, let E be Atopos. That seems to be a reasonable first sentence for a conference like this? You mean, uh, <laughs> yes, so I, I'm going to be lazy today and assume Topuses are Grotendieck. I, I don't need quite the full force of that, but you can easily think Grotendieck Topuses uh, all the way through. So I'm going to set up the isotropy group by analogy, and I first want you to think of the sub-object classifier of a Topos. So there's a functor on your topos that assigns to an object x the partially ordered set or lattice or frame, as you wish, of subobjects. Okay? And that's a contravariant assignment. And it's the definition of topos theory, of, of elementary topos, that this is representable via the subobject classifier. Okay? So the subobject classifier is then an internal frame. And in a sense, this internal frame captures the degree to which the topos is sheaved on the locale. And to make this a bit more precise, if we take the points of omega, so the subobjects of the terminal object, that is just the frame in sets, and we can take sheaves on it. And this is a topos that is the best locality approximation to the topos E. Okay. Now, a topos has more information than just this locale content. There's also a group or groupoid theoretic aspect to the topos. Okay. And in fact, famous representation theorems for toposes, Grotendieck toposes, say that every topos, and this is something Tiber mentioned already, can be represented as sheaves on a locale groupoid. All right. So not only do we have the locale content, we also have the group theoretic content, and toposes bring both together. Okay? So the obvious question then is, if the locale content is represented by an internal locale, the subobject classifier in the topos, is there also an internal group or groupoid that captures the group theoretic content? And the answer is yes, fortunately, uh, otherwise the talk would end here. So let me describe this group, uh, which we'll call the isotropy group. And again, we follow the route we took for the subobject classifier. We try to assign to an object of a topos, now not a lattice or a locale, but a group. And the obvious candidate is, of course, to look at an object X and then consider its automorphism group. However, there is an obvious problem. This is not a functor. Okay? If I give you an automorphism of x, and a morphism, say, from y to x, there is no meaningful way to produce an automorphism of y. Okay? That's just the fact of life. Okay? But if you really want this to be functorial, because we like automorphism groups, say, Right. If you really want this to be functorial, you can fix this problem. And this is what the isotropy group does for you. It, it takes something that's not functorial and, and tries to fix this. And the way to fix it is by replacing the automorphism group by this modified thing. Okay? And I'll try to explain in elementary terms what this group is. Oh, someone drew a smiley face. That is. It's very kind, but it has to go. Um. So first of all, we have E over X to E, the etal geometric morphism. And we're going to look at natural automorphisms of this geometric morphism. 
But a natural transformation between geometric morphisms is, say, maybe taken to be a natural transformation between the inverse image functors. But in this case, the inverse image functor has a further left adjoint, and this further left adjoint, let me call it X shriek, simply sends a morphism F from Y to X to its domain Y. So this is the functor that we're considering the natural automorphism group of. Okay. So what is then an element alpha in this automorphism group? Right. It's going to be natural, so to every object of E over X, it's going to associate an automorphism. So it's going to associate to F draw this a bit different, it's going to associate to this an automorphism, let's call this alpha sub f of y, right, that's the object data, and then there's the naturality condition, which says that if we had maybe another thing, so this is a morphism from gf to f in the slice, then we'd also have the automorphism uh, this way around, associated to this composite, the component of alpha at gf, and then naturality says that if I put g here, then this diagram has to commute. Okay? So this is what an element of this group looks like. It specifies for every map an automorphism of the domain subject to this coherence condition. Okay. In particular, we can, of course, evaluate at the identity of X, at the terminal object. That gives me an automorphism that I'll just call alpha sub X. And then, of course, this has to commute as well. Okay. So this is the sense in which this group fixes or enhances the automorphism group, if I have an alpha like this, I do get an automorphism of X, but I get more data and I get precisely the data that I need to re-index this automorphism along morphisms into it. Okay? So one intuition you may want to have as we, as we proceed is that if you're in a groupoid, then if I give you alpha X, all these are uniquely determined, you just conjugate. Okay? But in a general category or in a topos, there's no meaningful notion of conjugation and the isotropy group tries to remedy that. Right? It, it specifies formal conjugation data. Okay? So this is, this is what I just said, an element of isotropy is a coherent or compatible system of automorphisms. Okay? Now, this is functorial in an obvious way because you have natural transformation, so you can whisker, okay? So this, this is a functor, and this is what we call the isotropy functor on the topos E. Yeah. Now, for a subobject classifier, it was part of the definition that this functor, x goes to sub of x, was representable. This is a new construct, so now the representability becomes a theorem. Okay? For any Grothendieck topos, this functor I just described is representable, meaning there's an internal group in the topos such that homing into it gives you exactly this functor. And this is what we call the isotropy group. Okay? I don't need the full force of Grothendieck here, but what I do need is a small set of generators. And the way you prove this is showing that this functor I just described turns um, co-limits in E into limits in groups. And that means you can restrict to a small set of generators. Uh, yeah? Mm, yeah. Question? Yeah, um, please. No, I, I would want uh, just to make uh, one or two remarks. So. First, uh, the existence is just a consequence of the existence of exponentials mm -hmm. and the limits mm -hmm. in uh, Grothendieck topos. And uh, um, yeah, the, the, the main remark I would want to make is that, uh, in general, um, instead of taking automorphism, you could take as well endomorphism. 
Yes. Which, after all, is uh, more general or more natural because, uh, in general, an object does not only have automorphism, it, it has endomorphism. It is a more, it is a refined structure. Yes. And, of course, uh, endomorphism uh, functor defined in the same way uh, is representable as well exactly for the same reasons. And the relationship, is, so it is representable by an inner monoid of yes. your topos, exactly. whereas here you have an inner group of the topos, and the relationship between the two is the fact that the inner group is a group of invertible uh, exactly. elements yeah. in uh, the uh, inner monoid. Yeah, you can also generalize a little uh, what you have done um, by starting uh, with um, a morphism of toposis from a topos E to a topos E prime. Yes. And uh, what you do is uh, to associate to any object X of E the group or the monoid of mm -hmm. automorphism or endomorphism of the composite morphism of from E over X to E to E prime. Yes. And this, for exactly the same reason, is also representable. So this is uh, the... So it is representable by an object, uh, an inner group or an inner monoid of the, uh, of the topos E, yeah. which can be called the inner group of, uh, or inner monoid of symmetries of uh, your functor. So this, this of yes. course, uh, so yeah. this is the case when the functor is just the identity functor. Exactly. Uh, At the end, I have a slide with possible generalizations where we think of things like this, that the isotropy group of a geometric morphism um, or the isotropy monoid. When I gave this talk at a different occasion, Lovier said, why don't you consider the Lovier isotropy theory? Um, all of these things you can do. You can, you can generalize from endomorphisms to partial endomorphisms or endorelations. There's, there's various possibilities there. Um, we're sticking to this because this is the, the theory we understand the best and also because of the motivation we want locales and groups or groupoids. Um, so, but yeah, everything you said is, is true and correct. Um, it's enough to have a small set of generators. Yeah. So every object, there's a small set of objects such that every object in the topos is a co-limit of those. Uh, no, you need some exactness too. Yeah. But if you had an elementary topos um, such that every object was a co-limit of, of a specified small set of objects that would make this theorem go through. Well, it wouldn't give you that to have a pro-generator. I mean, one single object is sub-object. I mean, you want to get rid of the dependence on the set theory. Right? So you don't want to say a set of generators in the set. I'm not sure. That, that's, yeah. So what you need is uh, exponentials on limits. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but that's not elementary. No. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we just say Grotendieck. No, no, certainly more than that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, but I, I'm at slide two, so I should probably. <laughs> so let me give a few very simple basic examples to, to um, support your intuition here. Uh, when your topos is local, like this concept is trivial, and that's precisely captures the idea that these are orthogonal ideas. We have the locale content and we have the, the group theoretic content and these, um, well, this is one extreme of the spectrum. And on the other extreme, if we take a group and we take the topos of G sets, then the isotropy is all of G. But we have to think of G as an object of the topos of G sets. And there's three ways G lives inside B of G. There's, of course, the constant G set with value G, that's not it. Then there's Yoneda, the representable G, or the Cayley object, right, multiplication. That's, that's a wonderful object, but it's not a group because multiplication is not equivariant, of course. And then there's G with the conjugation action, and that's the right thing, and that's, that's what you get here, okay? 
Slightly more general, if you move from groups to, say, inverse semigroups, um, this was one of our original motivations to try to understand the relation between inverse semigroup theory and topuses. By the way, every Aton do can be presented in this way. So then the isotropy group recovers a concept in inverse semigroup theory, which is called the centralizer of the idempotence. So an inverse semigroup, this models partial symmetries on, say, a set. Uh, an inverse semigroup doesn't need to have a global unit, like a group does, but it has local units. These are the idempotents. Okay? And the isotropy group, when you evaluate it at such a local unit, gives you the sub-semigroup, which actually is a group, um, of all the elements which commute with that idempotent. Okay. Then, to justify the terminology, if you look at the topos of G-sets and you slice by a fixed G-set X, right, then we can compute the isotropy group of the slice topos. So this is a bundle of groups over X, and the fiber over an element little x is just the subgroup of G on those elements that fix little x. So that's traditionally called the isotropy group at x. And this is part of the reason for um, using this terminology. Okay. So a little bit of the theory. Um, one interesting aspect of the isotropy group is that it carries a canonical action. It acts on every object in the topos. Okay. And this is stated in this theorem. Um, every object of the topos carries this, say, right action um, by the isotropy group in such a way that every map of the topos is equivariant with respect to this action. And finally, when you look at the action of Z on itself, it's just conjugation. I'm not going to prove this, but I'll sort of the key insight is that instead of automorphisms of X shriek, the leftmost adjoints, we could look at automorphisms of the functor blank times x, which is the inverse image. And that, when you start unpacking that, you'll arrive at this. Okay. What is this action in the case, say, of G-sets? Well, the isotropy group was G with conjugation. How does that act on a G-set? Well, just the way G acts on the G-set, right? It's, it's completely tautological here. Okay. But hopefully that convinces you that this kind of thing does happen. To place this in a slightly more sort of abstract context, there is a notion that we call the cross topos, and the isotropy action is an instance of that. So if we take any topos E and any group in it, then of course we want to form G objects in this topos, right? And we find this group G with conjugation in that topos of G objects, all right? This is what I said earlier, but now sets replaced by E. So this process of turning a group in a topos into a new group in a new topos is in fact two monadic. So there's a two monad that takes a pair, E comma G, a group G and E, to this new topos that I denote B E G, so that's objects of E with a G action, and this new group G with conjugation in there. And this is a two monad, and you just need to think where it lives. It lives in the category, or the two category of group topos. So a group topos is just a topos with a group in it. Right? And given that this is a two monad, we can ask what the algebras are. And the strict algebra is what we call a cross topos. The reason we call it a cross topos is that in the special case where your topos E is itself H sets for some group H, you recover the old notion of a cross module. Okay? So this generalizes that. So if you unpack a little bit what an algebra is, well, in particular, it's a geometric morphism from this thing to this. So the inverse image has to take an object of E and equip it with a G action in some functorial way. Okay? And if you work through the monad laws, then you find out that it actually takes an object X and puts a an G action on X itself. Okay. That's, that's essentially what an algebra is. It's, it's a way to equip every object of the topos with 
an action of the group in a functorial or equivariant way. Okay. And of course, the isotropy action I described in the previous slide is an example of this. Okay. So the canonical action of Z gives me such a cross-topa structure, and in fact, it's the terminal one. Okay. This is the universal property of the isotropy action. Okay. Now, the following slide is a, is a bit of an aside, but it's interesting, and it shows some um, sort of connections with other areas. And this is what happens when we take the isotropy group and slice by it. And then E over Z, this slice topos, turns out to have a braided monoidal closed structure. Now, of course, whenever you have a monoid in a category and you slice by that monoid, then the slice gets a monoidal structure and it's exactly this formula. All right, you, you take a pair of morphisms into your monoid and you form the product and then you use the monoid multiplication to put them together. Now, Peter Fried and David Yetter used this in the very special case where E was the topos of G sets for a finite group to um, construct knot invariants. This is where the braided structure becomes relevant. So this is, this is a, um, a generalization of that. And the interesting thing is that this braiding is generally not a symmetry. Okay? But you can specialize to the objects that we call unital. And an object is unital when this map from x to itself, that first takes x to itself and to f of x, and then does the isotropy action, um, is the identity. Tibor? Uh, not entirely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't want to go through through all of it because this is really an aside, but um, it, it turns out to be braided and it's maybe equally non-obvious that it's closed. But it is. Yeah, we can talk about it later. If you want. Yeah. So there are these special objects. And the theorem then is, if you take the subcategory, the full subcategory on those unital objects, then not only is this a subcategory, but it's actually a quotient topos of the slice, and it's the universal solution to making this braided monoidal structure symmetric monoidal. Okay. So in topos theory, of course, deconvolution is sort of the standard way to produce symmetric monoidal closed structures on toposes, but here's another interesting way you can produce such things. All right, so let's get back to sort of the, the, the main course. We have this new invariant of toposes. Every topos has this group, and this group acts, and now we try to kill it. Okay, question? All right, no. um, and this is what the isotropy quotient purports to do. It's, it kills off this invariant, and then we see what we have left. So we have a topos E with isotropy group Z, and we consider the full subcategory on the objects for which this action by the isotropy group is trivial. Okay. So a priori, this is just a subcategory, um, but the theorem now is that it's a topos, and in fact, it's a connected atomic quotient of the original one. So the connected part just means that the inverse image functor, which is just the inclusion qua subcategory, is full. Okay. Um, and atomic then says that this inverse image functor is in fact logical. Okay. And this is what we call the isotropy quotient of, of E. So every topos has associated to it this connected atomic quotient. So in our examples, if you take G sets, then killing off the isotropy kills everything and you just get set. The, the objects for which the G action is trivial are just the sets, okay, end of story. Um, but you can have a slightly bigger thing. You can take, say, a topological group like the permutations of the natural numbers topologized in the usual way and you can consider continuous G sets for that. And the same thing happens, kill off the isotropy 
and everything is gone. In the infrasemic group case, and this was really our motivating example, if you kill off the isotropy, what you get is a topos that corresponds to the semigroup that semigroup theorists call the fundamental quotient of the semigroup. So if you have a semigroup, it has these idempotents, and you can look for the largest congruence that keeps the idempotents separate, so that does not identify distinct idempotents. That's what they call the fundamental quotient. And that's exactly what the isotropy quotient gives you in this particular case. Okay. Now, I want to give a more of elementary description of, of what this isotropy quotient is, not referring to actions of the isotropy group. Okay? So now we try to push everything down to sides. So if you have a small category, then for every object C, we have the isotropy group at C, and we have the automorphism group, and as I explained here, with C is equal to X, every element of isotropy has an underlying automorphism. Okay? So that is a group homomorphism from the isotropy group at C to the automorphism group. It's just forgetful. And in general, this is neither injective nor surjective. It's not injective because there may be different ways of re-indexing or lifting the same automorphism. And it's not surjective because some automorphisms may be unliftable. Okay. Either way, we can look at the image, write I of C for that, and we can look at the least congruence on the category that annihilates this. Okay. Why not? So this gives me a quotient of the category with the same objects, but with equivalence classes of morphisms, where two parallel maps are identified if they differ by one of these automorphisms in the image. Okay? And let's call that C theta, this quotient. Okay? And that we call the isotropy quotient of the category C. Well, in the pre sheaf case, this is the right thing in the following sense. Um, if E is equal to set to the C op, then on the one hand I can do the isotropy quotient of the topos, so look at the objects for which the action is trivial. On the other hand, I have this morphism from C to its quotient C theta, inducing this geometric morphism here, and then these two are equivalent. Okay, so this means that if we're interested in isotropy quotients of pre sheaf topuses, we can just work with the underlying categories and the congruences thereon. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens in the in the sheaf case? Um, if I take a subcanonical site, then I can easily compute the isotropy for that, and the theorem is the following. First of all, if you look at the pre sheaves on C and you look at the isotropy there, then the isotropy group already is a J sheaf. Okay. And it's in fact the isotropy group of the sheaf subtopos. Okay. Moreover, if you want to compute the quotient of the sheaf topos, so that, that is this thing, if you want to compute this quotient, then what you can do is you take on the level of sides this, this congruence map, you had a topology on C, and that induces a topology on C theta. You just take the images of the covering sieves. Okay. So now you have a site with C theta as the underlying category. You take sheaves on that, and that's the right thing. That's the isotropy quotient of the sheaf topos. Okay. Now, this all goes horribly wrong when your topology is not subcanonical. Okay. This, this is essential. But at least when you work with sites like that, you can push everything down to just working with um, small categories. All right. Now, we took an invariant, we killed it off, and one might expect to be done with it then. Okay. But something interesting happens, and that's perhaps sort of one of the, the deeper aspects of, of um, this otherwise elementary story that what can somehow happen in the process of killing off these isotropy maps 
is that new isotropy emerges. Maybe a, a good analogy here is, is the, um, say, the central series of a group. Right? You, you look at the centralizer or the commutants, you kill those off, but you may have new, and you, and you get a whole series. Right? And that's what might happen here too. You kill off the isotropy, but the result may have new isotropy that you then kill off and so forth. So for a small category, we define this ordinal indexed sequence. At stage zero, it's just the category you start with. And then at stage alpha plus one, you take the isotropy quotient. And at the limit ordinal, you, you have this chain built up so far, and you just take the co-limit of that. Okay? So that gives you a transfinite sequence of categories like this. And because C is small, right, there's only set many quotients you can form. At some point, this has to stabilize. And that's what we call the isotropy rank of the category. Okay. That's when nothing is left to be quotiented. Yeah. We can do the same thing for topuses. Right? Exact same definition. At stage 0, it's your original topos. At successor stages, you take the quotient. And at the limit stage, well, we have this chain of toposes, and we take the co-limit in the category of Grothendieck toposes. But this is actually easier than it sounds, because at each stage, you're just looking at a subcategory. So we just take the intersection of those categories. All right? And that gives you a chain like this. And when it stabilizes at a certain ordinal, we say that that's the isotropy rank of our topos. Now, the main results here are, first of all, that this is well-defined. This is an invariant of toposes. Um, for small categories, it's easy to see that it stabilizes just for cardinality reasons. Here, you need to do a little bit more work, but it's true. We have an invariant, and in the pre-sheaf case, the two agree. The isotropy rank of C is simply that of the topos. And the surprising thing is that, and that's the thing that takes work, is that if you give me any ordinal whatsoever, I will build for you a small category C that has exactly that isotropy rank. So all of this is, this is not a, a, an empty uh, theory. Okay? So all the ordinals occur as the isotropy rank of some category, hence of some topos. So now I want to switch a little bit and talk about this from the perspective of logic. Right? And we're going to take the perspective that every topos classifies some geometric theory, and we want to understand this invariant in logical terms. All right. So we take a geometric theory T. I'll write set T for its classifying topos. And that simply means, as we've seen a couple of times already, that T models in some Grothendieck topos E are the same thing as geometric morphisms from E to this classifying topos. And what's important for us is that this classifying topos possesses a universal T model that I'll denote UT. Okay. Now, the first um, easy but somehow informative statement is that the isotropy group in these terms is nothing but the automorphism group of the universal model. Okay. The only caveat is that you should understand automorphism group in the correct sense. It's not all the bijections in the topos from UT to itself. It's the model theoretic one, so they have to preserve the, the T model structure. Okay. There is a variation or more subtle statement due to Spencer Breiner, where you take your topos and you present it as sheaves on an equivariant groupoid, where this, where this groupoid is uh, the groupoid of models, set theoretic models. So you take the models of your theory in sets, you cut it off at some cardinality, big enough cardinality uh, to, to have enough models, so to speak. Um, you topologize in a suitable way. That gives you a topological groupoid. And then you take sheaves on that, equivariant sheaves. 
that presents this classifying topos. And now if you evaluate the isotropy group at an object, which is just the model M, then the stock of that, of that M there is the definable automorphism group of the model M. Okay. So definable means that there is a formula in the language that describes this automorphism. So it's a provably functional relation that has an inverse and so forth. And you're allowed to use parameters from the model M. Okay. So this, this gives you a connection with model theory, which is interesting, I think. Um, well, that's if, yeah, I mean, you could do the same with locale group or it if you wanted to, yeah. yeah. So let's look at a concrete example. Let's take the algebraic theory or the equational theory of groups. There we have an even simpler presentation of the classifying topos, of course, as they were alluded to earlier. Um, we just take the finitely presented groups and we take covariant functors from that category into the category of sets. And the universal model then is just a forgetful functor. Okay. The inclusion of finitely presented groups into groups. Okay. If you then work out what the isotropy group is, well, you can do that by hand, or you can invoke a theorem by George Bergman, um, who essentially sought out to characterize inner automorphisms in the category of groups. And he discovered that if you look at the automorphism group of this forgetful functor, that that is isomorphic to G itself. Right? Now, this is essentially co-isotropy. This is the co-isotropy group of the category of groups. Right? So the idea is here that we, we have an automorphism of a group G, and we ask whether we can extend it along group homomorphisms in a functorial way. And of course, if you have an inner automorphism, conjugation by an element little g, and you have a homomorphism from g to h, you apply that homomorphism to the conjugating element, and you get an inner automorphism of h, and that's how you do it. And Bergman showed that these are the only automorphisms that have this behavior. Okay. Now, his theorem was for all groups, but you can restrict to finitely presented groups, and then you characterize exactly the isotropy group of the topos. So the isotropy group of the topos is just the universal group. Okay. Of course, what else could it be? We couldn't have two groups in there, right, that are somehow universal. So the isotropy group of this algebraic theory is the same as the universal group. But we also know that the isotropy group is the automorphism group of the universal model. So as a corollary, we get that the universal group is, as we say, complete. It's isomorphic to its own automorphism group, which is not something I knew before I started thinking about this. Um, and in particular, of course, this shows that completeness of groups is not a geometric notion, because otherwise every group would be complete. Now we can sort of generalize to other algebraic theories and we have some general machinery to give completely syntactic presentations of isotropy groups of algebraic theories. And still in each particular case you have to work with the word problem for that particular theory. But we can use similar techniques and prove for example that if you do the isotropy group of the theory of monoids, you just get the group of invertible elements. For abelian groups, anyone want to take a guess? Our first guess was that it would be trivial because for ordinary groups it's just conjugation. It's inner automorphism. Of course, that, that's not interesting for abelian groups. But you have something else for abelian groups that, that is sort of polymorphic and that always works. And you have the identity, but you also have the inverse, which is a homomorphism for abelian groups, right? That, that can always be pushed forward. So this is a constant um, isotropy group. It doesn't depend on the actual abelian group M. And the constancy of the isotropy group is closely related to the commutativity of the algebraic theory. Um, those are almost the same thing. 
Um, finally, if you take something like the theory of lattices or so, um, everything trivializes, but you still need to sort of play around with the word problem to prove this. This, this all involves non-trivial applications of the word problems for these theories. Okay. Let's go back to the case of groups, because somehow it's, it's a very interesting test case. Um, we now want to compute the isotropy quotient of the classifying topos for groups. Okay. Um, in particular, we might be interested in the question whether this topos, the classifying topos for groups, has higher isotropy. Okay. Well, we know that we can do this on the level of sides, so we take finitely presented groups and we quotient out by this congruence. Now, what is this congruence? Again, T-Bar talked about this. It's you quotient out by conjugacy. You can view groups as sitting inside the category of groupoids, but that's a two category, and you kill off the two cells, and that means you kill off conjugation. So we identify two homomorphisms, phi and psi, um, precisely when they are conjugate by an element of H. Okay. So that's the category of finitely presented groups and outer homomorphisms. Okay. Can you describe a T theta? Yeah. Where? Ah, you want the theory for that. Okay, um, I have a slide <laughs> coming up. It's a good question, yes, yes. Um, but, but this leads, I mean, we're essentially passing to the homotopy category now, right? So this, this uh, leads us outside of algebra and into topology. So that's... Um, but now we have this category, same objects, but outer homomorphisms as maps. That's the quotient topos. And the theorem is that this is anisotropic. This has no isotropy left. Okay. Um, but this is far from obvious why it's true. And in fact, it w we cannot come up with an elementary proof of this. The, the proofs we have all use non-trivial group theory. For example, you can use small cancellation theory, something which is completely out of vogue. Of course, but um, there are results from small cancellation theory that says that, that say that you can take a group and embed it in a very specific way into a complete group. And if your original group was finitely presented, then so was the, the complete group in which you embed it. And you use facts like those to show that the isotropy of the quotient must be trivial. But we don't have an elementary or simple uh, proof of this. One might hope that this uh, follows from, you know, first-year group theory or so, but it doesn't seem to. Okay. We also don't know whether this carries over to other algebraic theories. That would be good to know. We suspect it does, but we don't have a proof in generality. Okay. Because our proof here uses such specific group theoretic facts. All right. Um, let me point out a few things we don't know or things we're looking at. First of all, we would like to be able to give a logical description of topuses with a specific isotropy rank. So you give me a logical theory and somehow by looking at that theory, I'd like to say what what is the rank of the associated topos, okay? So the conjecture is that for an equational theory, the rank is one, okay? But we don't even know that. Your question, if we take the quotient of the classifying topos for groups, that gives me another pre-sheaf topos, so it classifies something, it's a theory of pre-sheaf type. We don't fully know how to describe that in a nice way. The best answer I can give at this point is that it describes conjugation data on groups. What do I mean by conjugation data? Well, you can look first of all at the conjugacy classes of the group. That's the, the first level of data. And then you can look at G cross G and you can look at 
conjugation in that, that is the next level, and g to the power 3, and so forth. If you do that for every n, you get the conjugation data of the group, and that's somehow what is described here. Okay? But in general, I don't have, a, have an elegant answer to this question. A more topos theoretic question is, we have this connected atomic quotient. We take E and we quotient it, we get E theta. We'd like to describe E as a topos over the quotient. So we know it's connected atomic, but even if it has a point, then this doesn't seem to be uh, a simple question. Um, a specific case we could answer is when we have a point that is locally connected, or equivalently et al., then we can use the machinery of torsors and so forth to produce a group in the base topos such that E is G objects over E theta. But that's a very special case and we don't know what to do in general. Okay. This is just the point you brought up. We can, of course, relativize everything, not talk about the, geometric or the, the isotropy group of a topos, but of a geometric morphism. Um, there is something that I didn't say anything about, but it's actually um, harder than one might expect, and that's the behavior of isotropy across a geometric morphism. This is a non-trivial uh, problem for various reasons. One reason is the example there is the simplest example of the geometric morphism BG to set. Right. We've seen that the isotropy group here is G with conjugation action, and of course here the isotropy group is trivial. This is a logical geometric um, inverse image functor, so it preserves everything. All the topos structure is being preserved, but apparently not the isotropy group. So, amongst other things, this shows that isotropy is not sort of definable in the internal language. It's, it's an external concept. Okay. The other problem is that generally, if we have a geometric morphism, say from E to F, then there is no... Well, this as a special case shows that the inverse image need not preserve the isotropy, but what's worse, there need not even be a comparison map. And in complete generality, the best you can do is to show that there is a span between ZE and phi upper star of ZF. And this span has certain properties. One leg is a cross module and so forth. And in nice situations, for example, when phi is locally connected, this leg trivializes and you just get a comparison map of isotropy groups. But all of this is just to indicate that working with the transport of isotropy across geometric morphisms is somewhat non-trivial, and that, that, well, work is needed there. Okay. Finally, I want to mention uh, some generalizations. Obviously, the monoid is one, or the Lavier theory, although the latter is not representable. Um, but Simon Harry has proposed another generalization, which on the one hand is, is much better, because his definition is simply the following. You take the diagonal of a topos E, and you pull it back along itself. All right. Now the diagonal is localic, Right, so you pull it back, you get a localic topos over E, and you also show that there's a group action here, and you get a localic group in E that gives you this topos. So that's what he calls the localic isotropy group. Now obviously the appeal is the simplicity of the definition, plus the fact that it solves these kind of functoriality issues, because this construction is obviously functorial. Now, the downside is that this is a much bigger object um, that's much harder to compute. Even for simple topuses, um, yeah, you have to put in real work to compute this topus pullback. A topus pullback is, is generally an annoying thing to work with. Okay. Um, also, things that we see with ordinary, what might now co be called etal isotropy, um, 
such as the higher isotropy phenomenon, becomes invisible here because this group is so big it, it subsumes all of that and when you kill off this group then everything is gone. Okay. But this is a potential generalization and of course instead of looking at all isotropy you can look at, say on the open maps, you can look at the open part of this locale. Okay. And I'd like to conclude with a few references. Um, one thing in particular I should point out is Peter Freit's paper on core algebra. Um, we did our definition of isotropy in 2012 and then later we learned that Peter Freit had looked in the context of parametric polymorphism at something which he called the core of a category. And the core is closely related to the isotropy monoid in our terminology. Again, these are supposed to be the polymorphic operations in a category or in a topos. And um, so only recently we, we learned how to connect these two things. But this is interesting because this helps us understand connections with uh, theoretical computer science where polymorphism is an important topic. So I think I will leave it at this. Thank you.